Informal enterprises contributed an estimated 6% to GDP in 2017, boasting a market value of approximately 307 billion rands per annum. In 2021, sponsorships contributed as much as 5.2% to South Africa's GDP, employing over 2.6 million people. Welcome to the Corporate Profile feature, and I am your host, Tepin Ting. Today, I have the utmost honor of hosting the CEO of Gauteng Enterprise Propeller, Mr. Saki Zamklak. Saki, welcome to the Corporate Profile feature. Thank you. It's such a pleasure having you here. Thank you. And it's always nice engaging with executives, you know? Yeah, people of high caliber. How do you like it? Well, this is how we roll. <laughs> okay, first things first. What is the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller? How did it come about? What is its mandate? Uh, the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller is an entity owned by the Gauteng Provincial Government, um, largely funded uh, by the province. Well, now we do partnerships, uh, but it's largely funded by the province to support small businesses, small, medium and micro enterprises um, in all sectors, uh, either through grants, um, loans and other forms of support. Okay. So you speak a lot about being the lifeline for Gauteng-based SMMEs. You know, you lead and you spearhead the entity. As the CEO, what does your role entail? Well, the CEO's role effectively is to implement the strategy approved by the board. Um, you're responsible day-to-day -to, -day to manage people, uh, manage outcomes uh, and the implementation and make sure that the entity delivers to what it's meant to deliver. So ultimately, you've got to inspire and steer everyone to deliver on the mandate. So you also spoke about, you know, providing grants to, um, for SMMEs. Talk us through holistically your service offering as the Gauteng Enterprise Propel. So generally we are a demand-driven business. An entrepreneur comes to us and says, this is the form of support that they require. In terms of the act, which is what drives us, an act which established the entity in 2005, it detailed the things that we need to do and pretty much all of those cover what the requirements for <clears throat> enterprises in Gauteng are. So we deal at times with informal ones where you assist them to become formal because that helps. Um, maybe as a, you know, as a side comment, during COVID we actually learned that compliance is also important because some businesses couldn't qualify for insurance because they were not registered with SASRI. You now have an event which means people could qualify during the July unrest, uh, mainly actually uh, not so much COVID. Um, you know, people who could qualify to claim from insurance couldn't claim because they were not uh, registered as entities that were paying insurance, which was fairly minimal, uh, meant for these kinds of catastrophes, which don't happen all the time, but when they do, there could be benefits. So compliance at times is beneficial for the entrepreneurs themselves. The other one is, you know, we have uh, grants for businesses in townships. Um, some of them are 10,000 and some of them are 50,000 rands. Somebody is doing catering and they realize that they need some equipment, but maybe the revenue at the time that they're generating can support a loan to repay for that. So we'll pay for that equipment. It's an existing business, gives it an opportunity to, uh, to expand. Uh, some of those, interestingly now, have also been used for the effects of load shedding, where people are now having equipment that can mitigate the effects of that. So that would be another bucket uh, of um, you know, services that we provide, and then loans. The bigger component of what we do is loan funding. Uh, we'll do a term loan of up to five years. We'll do working capital for somebody who has a contract or a purchase order. You know, many entrepreneurs get a business uh, from a corporate, from government, and they don't have money to start and they don't know where to go. So we'll fund those. We'll go up to five million for what we call contract finance or purchase order. And then the normal term loans can be up to 10 million depending on funding availability. So also what is the turnaround time, especially for purchase order funding? So we target to do it in about two weeks, which is not ideal because some of them um, are still, um, you know, people have lesser time frames than that. 
Uh, but for us, because again, we deal with taxpayers' money, we're still very compliance-driven. And uh, for now, we're paper-driven. We're looking at our systems to see how we can make them better. Uh, but we'll try and do it in, in about 14 days, also depending on the availability of the documents. Because we need the entrepreneur to confirm the existence of the contract. We must independently verify that it does exist. Also then check a bit of their ability to deliver. So what is then the criteria, you know, for accessing assistance from Gauteng Enterprise Propel? So depending on what it is that you want, um, the basic thing is always a business plan. Um, ultimately, you know, investments, there's financial ratios that determine you have positive cash flows to be able to repay a loan in an event where you're getting a loan. But ultimately, you got to convince a committee because these decisions are made by committees and that your assumptions make sense. I would do a bit of due diligence. We will verify some of the things that you're saying. So your business must make sense. That is what we're looking for because not all, I mean, businesses, when you fund them, is generally about the future. Unless it is an existing business that has been there for many years, has established cash flows, by our very nature, we deal with small businesses and they're in a startup phase. Some of them are new. Even if they've been existing, they're not yet at a point where they are ready for commercial funding. So a lot of it is future looking than it is backward looking. And there's no one who knows what the future is. But when you come to us, that's why it's easy to do contract finance because we can see the future. This is where the cash flows are going to come from. Uh, but, you know, you, we funded restaurants where somebody comes and says, well, I've been operating um, a restaurant at this scale. You know, my turnover has been 200000 a year. I now want to scale up. I want to do a million a year. Then we fund them to get to the next level. So a lot of it is that you as an entrepreneur have got to first be convinced that the business case is strong. And beyond yourself, you then have to convince other people. Then we'll ask the supporting information, you know, first as an individual, what you're saying you're going to do, have you done it before? If you've not done it before, do you have people in your team who can do it? Because if you wake up and say, I want to run a restaurant and you've not run a restaurant before, your learning curve is likely to be longer than somebody who's done it. So not every entrepreneur has to always have the direct competency. Some of them are strong managers, but you will need a chef if you run a restaurant. You need waiters. And you've got to demonstrate that team. So depending on what the business is, because we're not sector focused, we cut across sectors, we then largely look at the basic business fundamentals to understand your costs, is the revenue, is the revenue at a point going to uh, cover the costs, and do you also have cash flows because it's cash that is going to pay a loan? Then where it is grants, again, they want to see that the business ultimately will be able to stand on its own because you can't give somebody a grant and they are still not sustainable because then they are perpetually going to depend on grants. You give them the grant because it now takes them to the next level. So the sustainability into the future has got to be very important. So once they access assistance from GP, is it once off or they can still come back to, you know, seek more assistance? No, you can apply. I mean, there are businesses which have gotten funding over a couple of years from us because that is part of growth. On year one, you need a loan of 100,000 rands. Year two, now your, your business has grown. You need working capital of a million. And on year, year five, maybe you need five million rands. So, so there can be a limit to, to how many times. Yes, in a financial year, we we'll limit how many times people can have access to grants because the grants are limited. So you can have one person who gets uh, the same grant 10 times when there are others who have not been able to receive them. So talk us through your experience. Do you have, I know small businesses get very frustrated when they deal with people who don't understand in practicality what it feels like to run a business, you know, the hardships, the struggles that they face every day. Do you have a, an existing business? Do you have an experience with running a business? So I do, but you know, what's interesting, you know, on social media, the uh, people who are having this conversation where yes, um, 
people who are decision makers that have been entrepreneurs, I think they bring a different kind of empathy coming from experience. But the other reality I think entrepreneurs must also respect is that people have different jobs. So when somebody is an analyst and their job is to analyze financial statements and see if this makes sense, you can't dismiss them on the basis that they've not run a business. Um, they have a job and it's financial analysis and if if what they are seeing doesn't make sense, it's based on the information available to them. So there is space, you know, when we're having this conversation, I said, you know, to this one friend, let's take an extreme example, uh, different to business, you know, uh, athletes. Athletes will have coaches who are not greater than them half the time, but the coach is able to help them see their mistakes and guide them on what to do. But back to your question, yes, uh, I've been an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, I, I had a camera when I was in high school. I used that to take photos to make money. It were film cameras at the time. Um, later in life, I registered a business which was an investment. Uh, one of the businesses I invested in was a stock exchange. First, first uh, business to get a, a stock, uh, um, a, an exchange license in South Africa. And there's been a few other investments I've done in ICT and other businesses. So I have, uh, I have been an entrepreneur on my own outside of just formal employment. But I don't think those uh, who are investment professionals and, and have not owned their businesses deserve to be judged on the basis that they can make investment decisions. Interesting indeed. Let's pack it here for now. The conversation will continue after the ad break. Welcome back to the Corporate Profile feature right here on your favorite channel, So Way to TV. I'm still in conversation with the CEO of Gauteng Enterprise Propeller, Mr. Saki Samtag. Saki, you borrow um, SMMEs money. And I know, probably, it's always difficult getting that money back. How do you deal with people who are unable to pay back the money? So there are several levels to it. The first one is that at the time of making the decision to lend, um, in the environment of limited resources, it is ideal that you fund those small businesses with the better chance to succeed. Um, as I said, a, a bit of it is, is technical, there's financial ratios, um, there's due diligence, there's everything else, but a bit of it is judgment because you're making decisions about the future. So it's important that we are responsible in the beginning on the decisions that we make without behaving like we are commercial banks because they have different <coughs> matrices that they get measured on. So ours is the development impact, which is funding those businesses which would otherwise not get the funding and they can now get to a point where they are ready for commercial funders. So, so the decision-making process is very important and that you, you do that. Then linked to it is um, follow-ups on the loans once you've given them, those that require support, uh, that you give them the support that they need, which is often difficult because, again, the budgets are not unlimited um, to be able to give a, every kind of support an entrepreneur want but some of the support can make a difference. And then the other one is when there's a problem, what do you then do? Um, if you know the entrepreneur is cooperating, is not cooperating, you then take legal action. If they are, you can still make arrangements for them to pay over time. So we do take legal action, um, which is often limited to the business. So typically our security is the business itself because that's what we fund. We may, where the risk is too high, ask the entrepreneur to put some skin on the game, yeah, but that's never a one-to-one -one ratio. We don't say we're giving you 100 uh, and put 100 as security. Um, the security may be less than that, but where the risk is, is too high, we want to also see that the entrepreneur is committed. Um, examples for where security is not necessarily very important, personal security, is where you have a contract. If you have a contract, the cash flows are secured, this is a listed company, the risk often is then the delivery risk. So we then secure the cash flows and say we want to make sure when the money comes into your account, we get paid. 
in that instance, then the security at a personal level becomes far less than somebody who comes and says, I want a term loan. This is a complete startup. Um, and you know, and it doesn't have any cash flows. So there, you want you know the entrepreneur to show some commitment. As I'm saying, it is far less than other institutions would do. So, so we, like any other institution, will then follow a legal process when when there's was when there's non-payment. So, what is the duration from a lending perspective when you get into a contract with whoever you're lending money to? So it depends, but the maximum we have is 60 months, uh, five years. So our term loans go up to a five-year period. Uh, but if you having a contract where you deliver in two weeks, we may have an agreement that we get paid in 45 days, which may be 30 days after you've delivered and submitted the invoice, <clears throat> depending on who um, the issue of that you know purchase order is. Um, but so it can be anything, you know, from a month to 60 months. And default ratio, has it changed? It's changed very significantly, and we'll report on that at the end of the year. But over the past couple of years, we've been um, collecting far better than it has happened, um, let's say, on the year that ended 2020, 2021. 2022 was better and 2023 was even better. And already this year, um, we had exceeded our target in the first quarter. But those were low because of the history. So a lot of them were planned on a three-year cycle. And that three-year cycle was informed by what had happened in the previous years. And now it has, it has changed significantly. So there's a lot more entrepreneurs now who are repaying, which is important because that money goes back to funding other entrepreneurs. So like you lead one of the biggest business entities, you know, in the entire country. How would you describe your style of leadership? Hmm. Uh, I think generally I'm forthright on, you know, this, this is what needs to be done. This is what needs to be delivered and, um, and get us to focus on, on results. Um, so I'm always driven by that. But one of the things I've got to learn over many years is that, People are people, they're not robots. They need a bit of inspiration. You've got to always have your pulse, uh, your finger on the pulse because there may be things happening in the business that you don't see that are causing people to be demotivated or are impacting on delivery. So the ability to hear what's going on is important, but for me, often the focus is results. How, I know GP had a huge backlog, you know, from a funding perspective. How has that improved? What are the measures in place to ensure that you know we overcome that? So the big thing is that the funding uh, we get, and this is again a function of the country not having unlimited resources. So the budgets are tiny. Uh, the budget for the entity has historically been about two hundred million, including operating costs. Um, so the ability to fund is then limited by that. But fortunately, the provincial treasury has been doing some readjustments uh, to put money into the business, where the ones of 250 million were given and we entered into partnerships. We did uh, a partnership with uh, ITC of 400 million. Um, SASME came into it and put 100 million. We had one with the NYTA Youth Fund and there was one with a private sector entity that is in agriculture and they were doing enterprise development on agriculture. So there's a couple of uh, partnerships we, we did to broaden the check. So to deal with the backlog, really the starting point has got to be got to have enough money. Um, this year, I mean, in the first six months of the year, we ran out of the budget and we had uh, the Department of Economic Development and Provincial Treasury giving us additional funds, which is then positive, because it then means the applications are being considered and the money is being dispersed. So um, GP attained an Adlin audit recently. You know, what are you doing differently now that there's a new board of directors? Um, so governance, I mean, has been important uh, because, as I said, firstly, it demonstrates that we're responsible about the decisions we make. You don't have auditors that come and say we can't place reliance on the numbers that they tell us what you've been doing. So, so that we had to deal with. There were 
um, you know, by the year ending 2021, eight audits that were done, we completed seven of them. The one which was not complete was the one done by the SIU because they report to the president and that will also be done. But a lot of the things covered there were already largely dealt with in the other investigations we did. So we completed them, did the corrective measures, which range from policy, you know, changes, strengthening systems and processes, you know, people, and, and at times disciplining where there had been recklessness. So that was a, a lot of focus. I think the new board, which has recently been appointed, comes into a business that's a lot more stable. Now the next thing is, is growing it and growing it to have more impact. So what sets, what sets GP apart from other business organizations? Why would a small business want to come to GP instead of other business organizations? Well, there's many development finance institutions. You have your ITCs, CIFA, DBSA. Some have different mandates, but CIFA, the Small Enterprise Finance Agency, does what we do, which is financing small businesses, but at a national scale. What we've done is to position ourselves not in competition with them, we have partnerships. So we work with CIFA, we work with NEF, we have a fund with the ITC, we have a fund with the NYTA. So, so the, the benefit is that we now channel money that would otherwise not come into Gauteng enter, entrepreneurs to come to them through these partnerships. But really at a customer level, we're trying to make the experience better and that the turnaround times are quicker and the businesses that deserve to be funded can be funded. So there are small businesses, some would say, I applied three years ago, I haven't gotten any assistance, I've got a reference number. So will those businesses be considered? Are you then taking care of such businesses to ensure that if anything, you know, worst case scenario, they do get responded? Yes, yeah, so we often encourage people who have uh, reference numbers um, to apply. There is a time in the business where not all applications were done online. We changed this about two years ago so that at least we are able to track. Yes, because of the volumes of applications we get, not everyone gets a decline letter, but it, typically a lot of those applications would be grant funding, which is often year-end specific. At the end of that year, when the budget is finished, the budget gets to be finished. But we are improving now the responses that people get the responses. But those who say that can inquire and will get a response to them. Uh, but my recommendation would be that they reapply, um, especially if it were grants. Um, but even if it was a loan, um, assumptions in your financial statements of three years ago would be different to uh, what, you know, uh, the assumptions should be today. Uh, but yes, uh, those who have uh, queries, we encourage them to either go to our branches or email us on the inquiries at gp.co.za or call center. Um, Nomonde and team who deal with the queries can then get back to them. Let us go for a quick ad break. The conversation will continue when we come back. Welcome back to the Corporate Profile feature. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. As we continue with our talk with the CEO of Gauteng Enterprise Propeller, Mr. Saki Zamklag. So Saki, which attributes should one instill in order to become successful in business? A difficult question because I think all of us uh, as entrepreneurs or people who look at entrepreneurs may have different views and it may be sector specific. But I think a generic one is just resilience. Um, the one thing I think if you've worked a journey as an entrepreneur is that it has its ups and downs. Um, cash flows are unpredictable. Um, you could have a, a business where you project this is how things are going to happen. But even when you do get the business, uh, maybe cash flows will come late and salaries must be paid end of the month. And maybe even you as an entrepreneur have got to continue surviving. Um, when entrepreneurs start, often their income uh, relies largely on the business. And if the business doesn't have an income, it impacts even on you as a person. So I think mental strength um, generally is important to be able to deal with pressure because you are going to have it if you're an entrepreneur. And the second thing is that I think over time, you got to 
be on a mode of continuous learning. You got to self-improve. You make mistakes. How do I not make these mistakes again? Um, you find ways of getting into the right networks, um, which may be important for, the, for your revenue and the business to grow. But also people who may give you sound advice that if you run um, a TV station, these are the changes that are happening in the sector. These are the revenues to mitigate against falling advertising revenue. This is what else you can do. So continuous learning and, and maybe just, you know, your own mental strength are probably what is going to keep you running as an entrepreneur, irrespective of what sector you're in. So let's talk about your beneficiaries. Once you assist SMMEs, do you then go back to track what is it that, how they've grown? you know, prior to you offering them assistance? Not all of them, uh, but every year we do run surveys to look at uh, customer satisfaction. We run surveys to look at the impact of what we're doing. Some of the assistance we give is too small. So, the, you know, the follow up on to every entrepreneur may end up even being costly than the actual support that you've given. So we place a lot of um, emphasis on in the beginning, making sure these are the right people, this makes sense, and then we will sample um, some of them to check what the impact has been, but not every business. But in general, it's important even for us to see whether there is growth in these businesses, uh, because that's how we, we can improve. So let's talk about accessibility. How you how do you ensure as Gauteng Enterprise Propeller that you become accessible, especially to people in secluded areas? So for us, I mean, we receive uh, more than 500 applications a month. Um, as I said, we, we dispersed the entire budget which was allocated before, uh, uh, you know, half of the financial year <clears throat> until we got additional funding. So we do believe that generally entrepreneurs with the resources that we have are able to, uh, to access us. But we have six regional offices across the province, and we do try and be in, even in the areas which are not traditional city centers. We have a satellite office in Heidelberg, for example, and we have another one in Bronco Sprite. So we do try and uh, be as accessible to as many entrepreneurs as possible. We also have online presence. We have a website where people can apply and also on social media. Most people are on Facebook, uh, you know, Twitter, um, Instagram. So we're also on those platforms where uh, entrepreneurs are able to reach us. Also, is there an age limit, you know, in terms of people who can apply? You know, some organizations would say it's only for youth in business with GP. Well, the first uh, limit is, you know, whether you're, you're a person who can enter legally into a contract. That's the only limit we have. But we don't say if you're not a young person, we can't fund you. <clears throat> so we do have a youth fund that's specifically for youth, but we do fund uh, other entrepreneurs even beyond youth. Okay. So what is the turnaround time or, you know, period for a standard application? Once you apply online for starters? Um, I think we've had the question. How <laughs> soon can you <laughs> get it? Uh, yes, we, we've covered it. So as I was saying, I mean, on the contract finance, uh, our target is about 14 days. And then on the normal term loans where the due diligence is usually a bit longer, we target about 30 days. But that's always subject to the complexity of the transaction and the availability of the information. Because as the due diligence is being done, there may be certain things the entrepreneur must go back and do and come back to us. Okay. Do you have core sectors that you focus on as Scouting Enterprise Propeller? Or just about everyone in different sectors can apply? Um, the province has identified what it has been called 10 high growth sectors where there's a focus, but if you really look closely at them, they cover everything. So there are sectors we exclude. Um, and when an application comes, we don't say to you, no, you're not important. It's whether the business makes sense or not. Yeah. Even a person who wants to establish a church. Yes. Yeah. It's allowed. Right. So you don't discriminate. We don't discriminate. Yeah. Let's talk about the LGBTQI+. Plus. You know, um, what has been the magnitude of support from Gauteng Enterprise Propel towards them in particular? So we've put a target 
uh, on some of our support program that a certain percentage must go to the community. Um, and that's the one target that we have. But on other applications that come, except if an individual discloses, you don't know that they belong to the LGBTQI community. But, but as I'm saying, we do have a target on, on some of the support programs where a percentage of the money is to the community. So do you then identify them or just about everyone who falls within the... No, anyone project? can apply. So yeah. how our system works is that we don't come and say, you know, approach the GP and apply. People will apply on their own. Yeah. And then, you know, through a certain criteria and we'll evaluate. That's the only way the process becomes fair. Yeah. So like how is important how how important is education, especially in your line of work? We get a lot of entrepreneurs that are very successful and don't even boast, you know, education, so to speak. But how important is it? So this for me is a very you know difficult subject because I don't agree that a lot of the entrepreneurs who succeed are those who don't have schooling. I think there is a significant number that has um, succeeded without schooling, we can't discount it. But I think generally in the modern economy uh, over the past decades and centuries, education plays an important role. Uh, the ability to put the documents together, um, the ability to comprehend what you need to do, the ability to stand in front of someone and demonstrate you have some sort of experience, um, if you're saying I want to start a healthcare business, uh, but you're not a doctor, at least demonstrate to us that maybe you have some management experience, you've run a fund and you're running a fund that will be, you know, investing in healthcare. <clears throat> but it's important in general to have something that backs you. And I think we tend to use a lot of exceptions um, because the entrepreneurs who've, um, you know, succeeded widely without experience, it's not often easy to replicate that, <clears throat> but you can replicate that, you know, to run a law firm and succeed in it, you must be a lawyer. Well, firstly, you can't run certain incorporations without being a professional, but I'm just using those as extreme examples. You, you know, if you want to go and say, I want to start a food business and you have no training in food, you are on a disadvantage than somebody who has training. <clears throat> um, some may have had actually the training informally, um, and we see this in, let's say, car repair sectors. You'll see it even in the food sector. And there's many others where people have experiential learning. But I think it's dangerous for young people to think that that is enough. Um, there is a role for school. It makes a big difference um, in your ability to be employable, but also in your ability to convince another person who's going to put money into your business that at least you have discipline, you've been able to go to school, get a qualification, but two, you can comprehend what you're doing, you can write documents when you need to, otherwise you're also going to almost always rely on other third parties to write the information for you. So you get a small business in the free state, you know, watching right now. Um, they're thinking, let me go and approach Houting Enterprise Propeller. Do you assist businesses outside of the province? No, we don't. Um, we assist businesses that are registered in Gauteng. Economic benefit is in Gauteng, even if they have uh, economic activity elsewhere. So you could be here and you're doing business elsewhere. And that's because we're funded by the provincial government. But <clears throat> those entrepreneurs can go to CIFA, they can go to the NEF, they can go to the ITC. Those entities are national. And those who have, you know, different branches around the country. And one would say, I'm full operational in a different province, but I do have a branch in, in Gauteng. And I'm, I'm seeking funding for my branch in Gauteng. Do you assist in that yeah. regard? Okay, yeah. yeah. So let us talk through um, your, your standard requirement. I know at times, especially when you're seeking um, assistance, financial assistance, yeah, people always complain to say it is tedious, the requirements are a lot. How have you made it very easy for SMMEs, especially you know, you understand um, the hardships for them to even get those compliance in order. It's quite, yeah, it requires a lot of time and commitment. Yeah, so there's no very easy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, I mean, anyone who's done business, even when they come to us, they have a contract, it wasn't easy to, to get that contract. 
Um, if you be it, whether in the private sector or government, you've got to submit documents. You don't go to them and say, I have this wonderful idea, and you talk to them for five minutes and you get a business. You must submit documents, you must you know, meet the criteria that is required. It's the same thing with funding. So you've got to have a business plan, you've got to be registered with SARS, um, you know, the business must be registered one form or the other, uh, whether it's a PTY or incorporation. Um, and then the others may be sector specific. If you're saying you're running a liquor business, you must show that you have a liquor license because you can't trade illegally. So the, the compliance requirements are very basic for any funder. Uh, where the complaints always are is, you know, um, you guys are saying I must have, have bank statements, I've just uh, uh, opened the business. Yes, show then those bank statements for the business that has operated. Then you may be asked to do some financial forecasting. And if you don't want us to ask you to do financial forecasting, when you don't uh, succeed, how to demonstrate that we applied ourselves when you submitted your application. And I then suggest that when you're at a point where you don't have the documents that's required, maybe apply to these DFIs to get your documents in order because we will pay for your financials to be done. If that's what you require, we'll pay for your business plan to be done if that's what you require. Maybe then that's the starting point, either than hoping that you know the requirements are going to be lowered um, because you are an entrepreneur. But as I'm saying, we are now developing other products like contract finance, where we're saying, okay, maybe your historical bank statements are important for us to know that we're not dealing with an insolvent entity uh, because we can really land into an insolvent entity and you're not going under business rescue or many other things which may be detrimental to us as a creditor. But a lot of then the reliance is on, on the contract that you have. We know where the the cash flows are going to come from and won't put too much strain on you know the historical performance the conversation is getting interesting but for now let us take a quick ad break we will continue after this welcome back to the corporate profile feature we have reached the last segment of the show and we are still joined in the studio with the CEO of Gauteng Enterprise Propeller, Mr. Saki Samklag. Saki, I know you don't want to leave. It's very interesting. <laughs> we could talk for four hours because when it comes to entrepreneurs, I know they're definitely taking pointers. But also let's talk about once they get that, that assistance. Um, sometimes they would come to you for business development support. Say we want certain equipment and then they don't necessarily take that equipment, because I know that you, you pay their suppliers and not directly to them. Please explain that holistically, what happens within that. So generally, and it's not just on uh, the business development support, as we call it, uh, where we don't pay the entrepreneur directly. So when we do finance, uh, except the portion which may be salaries, <clears throat> so we'll pay into the entrepreneur, but we will pay for the equipment because we want to know that the money went to what it was intended for. Because there's always a risk. I mean, we human beings, um, you know, it's now December, kids are writing school exams and they tell you they are going to kick them out next week if you don't pay. There's a very big risk. You're going to take the money and go and pay the school fees and think, okay, I'll make a plan uh, for the business and so so there are those you know and there are others who are also mischievous and they just simply don't use the money for what it's intended so as a way of mitigating risk uh, we make sure that we pay the suppliers um, but part of the due diligence also is that if you come and say I want camera equipment at least prove to us that you are doing some sort of photography otherwise we could easily just get people who come ask for money, we give them the equipment, they go sell it. And, you know, it doesn't go to what it was intended. Because really for us, because this is government money, <clears throat> its mandate is to help entrepreneurs. We want that photographer who otherwise would not have been able to buy <clears throat> filming equipment that can give them a gig at Soweto TV, that they now um, have a foot in. 
And with that equipment, they can grow. They can now hire somebody else with a drone that's going to back them up, uh, you know, grow into, into a business that becomes sustainable. So it is important that that, that checking is done in the beginning. You also um, said that the, the grant amount varies. Some get 50,000 rands and some it's 10,000 rands. Talk us through how different is it? Who qualifies for 10,000 rands and who qualifies so, for 50? So when you apply, uh, there's different grants that we have. Like, I mean, there's a township uh, renewal grant, uh, business renewal. There's, there's one for equipment. There's one for business development support. There's one for informal traders, so depending on what it is. Um, the, the numbers are a cap. So we say, because this is free money and we have a limited budget, we limit it to 50,000. Uh, the youth fund is higher. Uh, the grant component is a maximum of 500,000. So even if you apply beyond that, we will we'll cap it at that level. But other people come and say, I only want 100,000 and we'll fund that but within the different, so it's the different categories I was mentioning. Okay, so there's a business perhaps that was registered a few months back, fully compliant, but hasn't, it's not operational yet. Do you assist with funding? We can, but it's going to be on the strength of, it's not just you have a bank account, you are registered, is the business that you are trying to get funding for ready to, repay a loan once we grant the loan. So you still must answer that question. Okay. So for purchase order funding, do you pay into the business or you also do the same? You pay the suppliers? We pay the suppliers. We pay the suppliers. Okay. And then when it comes to um, financing the business, you spoke about 5 million rents max. Um, 5 million rents max. Um, how do you then monitor that? It, it, it's put towards what it was requested for. So the first one, as I said, I mean, there's a due diligence that is done where we say, okay, you're telling us you're starting a business um, um, that is Soweto TV, you're going to employ 50 people, um, and you already have 20 that are there, so we'll go and check, do the 20 exist? Do you have premises? You're saying to us you have advertising revenue of X, does it exist? Um, and then you're saying you're going to buy equipment. Okay, how much is the equipment? Then we verify that the, the codes that we got are valid. And, and, and so there's the whole process that goes into it, that by the time the money is paid, we're not only just relying on the fact that there's a code that is coming through. Somebody has gone to actually check that the code is valid and we're not paying into an account that doesn't exist or, you know, I put my own account, but just put a logo of a different thing and the money comes to me and not where it was intended. So there is a due diligence process that gets into it before the payments are done. And then when the payments are done, we then verify. Okay. A lot of co um, businesses were hard hit by COVID. Some can even literally couldn't recover. In terms of getting assistance from Houting Enterprise Propeller for COVID-19 relief, um, was it a matter of them you know, having to prove that they've been hard hit by COVID or what was the core requirement prior to them getting assisted? So two things, I mean, many businesses were affected by COVID. So it's easy to say you are affected by COVID. So the part of it was demonstrate you are affected, but also demonstrate to us how you're going to get out of it. Um, because then for a temporary period when we had the fund on the July unrest. Uh, there was also assistance for those who were affected by COVID. But the point was beyond telling us that COVID affected you, it's also showing us what your recovery plan is. Uh, because you know we had made it 50% grant, 50% loan. So the loan component still has to be repaid. So because the temptation at times could be, I'll just take the money, settle creditors and move on then that doesn't help us because the idea was to get businesses that want to get back to business back on their feet. Saki, what are the aspirations for, you know, Gauteng small businesses and Gauteng enterprise propeller beyond what is happening now, or what you have attained during your tenure thus far? So for us, uh, like everybody else, we appreciate that um, the small businesses are the lifeblood uh, of any economy. Uh, on a daily basis, you know, we buy lunch somewhere. Um, you take your clothes to a dry cleaner. 
you go to your hair somewhere, you go into your nails somewhere, you take your car to be fixed by somebody. So they, it's, not, uh, it's not rhetoric that they carry the economy and employ people, but they affect our lives on a daily basis. There's someone who is transporting a child to school. There's you know, somebody who owns a taxi. There's all manner of businesses that come. So we want ultimately those businesses to have access to the financial instruments that they require to grow their businesses and not end up at one level. Because if you can't access finance, you run a taxi, it's just one, you can't get into the next one, or you run a saloon, and you can't, and we then end up having, you know, big franchises uh, getting into spaces where there's been people, someone in Lokshin who's had a saloon, now suddenly next door there's a saloon that is bigger um, and there's more equipment than them or somebody has been running a liquor store, now there's a big franchise that's pushing them out of business. So we don't want that displacement. We want the entrepreneurs to grow and ultimately own their space without the threat in an economy like ours where there's dominance in pretty much every sector. I mean, you can go to banking, you can go to law, um, financial services broadly, retail, there's big dominant businesses. and. And there's always a risk of them being anti-competitive or them pushing out uh, small businesses. So we want a province where being an entrepreneur um, gives you hope that you can become what you want to be. And there isn't a limit that beyond this limit, you know, you're going to be taken over or pushed out by a big corporate. In closing, what would be your words of encouragement to all the businesses, small businesses out there? that are finding it difficult, you know, to break even, to grow? What, how would you encourage them to keep their businesses afloat? The fact that they've started is a big step already. Um, you get better at it with time. Um, always seek information. Things are getting better and better. I think more and more money in government and the private sector is going to small businesses. If you knock at the right doors, you'll eventually get the money. And the right doors are no longer as difficult. Um, where you don't know where to go, ask entities like GEP, ask entities like CIFA, who has a mandate similar to what you want. But when you go to these entities, it's usually better that you are clear what you want. Okay, I would like to be in business, I need assistance with a business plan. Or I am running a business, I have a plan, I want to expand, this is what I want. Often, you know, people come and say, I want to start a business, uh, where can I get help? And you say, what business? Um, in, in the business, what do you need? So it's important for you as an entrepreneur first to, to go through a thought process of what do you actually want, what do you want to do? And then it's easier for people to then guide you on your own path. But when you go blank, um, it is very difficult because a funder can also play a dual role of advising you and funding you. Um, you know, if we advise you, we pay somebody else to do that. If that's what you need, you need a coach, we can pay for that. But, but it's usually better if, uh, if you go to, to investors, whatever form they are, with a story. This is what I want. Let them say yes or no. Don't try and tailor yourself so much to what they want. Go and say, this is my story. They will give you feedback and then you go back and work on it. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Zamtaga, for joining us today on this episode of the Corporate Profile feature. And there you have it. That was an insightful conversation with the CEO of Gauteng Enterprise Propeller, Mr. Saiki Zamtag. Show me any channel that can beat the magnitude of the show or the caliber of the guests we bring for your viewing pleasure. And I'll wait. It is estimated that load shedding costs South Africa over 4 billion rands a day. Small businesses are the most hard hit due to the production and productivity loss, profit loss, payment issues, Wi-Fi down, security issues, cell phone networks going down, electronics damage, increased costs in alternative power supplies and increased traffic issues. As of January 2023, approximately 25% small businesses had shut down due to load shedding. It is always an absolute pleasure and privilege to bring you this corporate profile feature exclusive to Soe2 TV. I remain your host with the most, Tepin Tinya, and this is another exciting episode of the corporate profile feature. Until next time, God bless you.
Thank you.